Um, it's my pleasure to introduce to all of you Reverend Huber Brown III. Um, he is a known community organizer, social justice activist, and a pastor of Pleasant Hope Baptist Church. Um, I think the first time I heard about Pastor Brown was um, working, doing volunteer organizing with United Workers years ago. And then I would run into him at the end of the school to prison pipeline events. Um, and well, first the algebra, Baltimore Algebra Project events before they were doing this end the school to prison pipeline campaign. And then once the campaign began. And so, um, which is actually what led me to begin attending Pleasant Hope Church. Um, so right now, um, some other things to know about Pastor Brown is that he has a BS in, psycholo uh, in psychology from Morgan State University, a Master's in Divinity from Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Theology at Virginia Union University, and in 2006 he was ordained. Um, Currently, he's pursuing his doctorate of ministry at Wesleyan Theological Seminary in D.C. He is the recipient of the Ella Baker Freedom Award, the Kingdom Ambassador Award, and the United Workers Human Rights Champion Award. The Baltimore African American newspaper recognized him as one of the 25 under 40 emerging black history leaders. In 2011, the Urbanite magazine identified him as one of the change makers of Baltimore City. And I can't leave this part off. <laughs> he married his best friend, Shantae, nearly a decade ago, and they are the proud parents of two charming boys, <laughs> Ethan and Peter. That's it. That's it. Good job. That's so important. Uh, good morning, everybody. Yeah, good morning. So good to see you this morning. Um, I'm thankful to be here. And let me say, off the bat that, uh, yes, this is uh, a workshop, a lecture, a talk, a dialogue about the black church, but this is not church. So uh, I really expect us to really engage one another and share our experiences, our thoughts, <clears throat> and views as I attempt to speak in an hour about this humongous and historic institution of the black church. Um, before I get started with my piece, I'd like to learn a little bit about you, if you could just introduce yourself and just answer uh, the question of why you're here and or what you're hoping to hear. It really would help me to, uh, to focus my presentation a little bit more to what people in this room are really interested in hearing about. So why are you here or and what are you hoping to hear about the black church? And uh, can we start here and the snake around to the back, yes. Hi, my name is David. Um, I'm here because I'm working on a, a food justice project in Brooklyn, and we're, there are a lot of folks who are uh, very active in the black church, and then other folks who are. So just hoping it'll, it'll be good for, for that project. OK, cool. And that's good. Thank you, David. If you're not from Baltimore, just let me know where you're from. I'm Katie. And I'm from Baltimore, and I'm here because I'm one of the volunteer organizers of the conference. And because um, I thought it would be good to get Hebrew here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so thank or blame Katie. <laughs> uh, my name is James. I'm here from Sarasota, Florida. Um, I'm co presenting a panel at 11 on uh, the history of race and anti-racist activism. Oh. And one of the parts of it is a call for people to start engaging with uh, organizations of people of color that they may not be already, and part of that is the black church, so. Good stuff. Cool. Thanks, James. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Libby. I'm from Columbia, Maryland, which is like half an hour away. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm here because I don't really know a lot about the black church, and anything that I learn would be beneficial to me. <laughs> You're going to be easy to please. <laughs> I'm Sarah. I'm here in Baltimore. And I'm here because I'm interested in learning more about the black churches and change, particularly 
and Baltimore is a very kind of historically religious um, city. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thanks, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm Claire. I am from Maryland, but I'm currently living uh, in Portland. And I'm here because I've been involved with um, some immigrant rights organizing that is based in church communities. And so I'm interested in hearing about black churches and churches in general and how they can be um, a place for radical change. Thanks, Claire. Hi, I'm Rachel. Um, I live here in Baltimore, and I am I'm a Catholic and have been involved in different um, like faith justice groups. And currently, I'm starting to work with the steering committee for interfaith worker justice. And so, we are hoping to reach out to different. Did churches. you email me? Julia might have. Oh, okay, okay, cool. <laughs> my Bob, my Bobby later. Okay, okay. Um, so, I'm excited to partner more and work with um, Black Church, and I attend St. Matthew's, which is a pretty diverse church. Black Raven and Woodburn? Mm -hmm. Black Raven and Woodburn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Glad to be here. Thanks, Rachel. Mm -hmm. Hi, guys. I'm Carol. Um, I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York, but I live in D.C. now uh, doing immigrant rights work as well. And I attended this really cool talk about um, the BDS movement against Israel, um, and it was like how the black church was a game changer and all of that. So I'm just interested in learning more. Wow, where was that? It's like right by, by where I live. It's like near Rock Creek Park. Um, it's like Rock Creek Church. Church. Yeah. Rock Creek Church. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Good stuff. I'm Amanda. I live in DC, and um, I'm not sure. I guess I like coalition building and how different groups do um, movement building and how to engage different groups. So I wanted to. I'm just interested in what you're doing. Cool. Mm -hmm. Good. Thanks, Amanda. Right, um, I'm Athena. I'm with Occupy Our Homes. We've probably hounded you with emails as well. Michigan. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, we, we're now currently hosting home relations events meetings in a black church now in Park yeah. Heights. And so we're kind of just wanting to hear what you yeah. think about that. Beautiful. Thanks. Athena, right? Okay. Thanks. Nick? I mean, sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Um, I'm Nick. I live in Baltimore. Um, as a revolutionary, I have a strategic interest in different forms of organization in the black community as well as sort of a political and, I don't know, spiritual interest in the relationship between radical politics and spirituality and religion. 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 Mm -hmm. Thanks, Nick. I'm Elena. Um, I'm here because I've been an anti-racist organ organizer for a really long time. Um, I have some familiarity with the role of the black church during the civil rights movement, but I think there's probably a lot more history than that that I don't know. And of course, I also recently became a member of your church, so that's another reason that. Yay! That's a big thing. side of Baltimore uh, and I'm working with our neighborhood school growing vegetables um, and I want to learn about organizing and um, I'd like to organize the neighborhood around this and one of my concerns is that I've always been sort of outside of the church and Christianity is real important to some people so I, I wonder about um, not, uh, not fitting in as a non-Christian. Mm. So, um, how, how you might organize as one who is not a Christian, how do I gauge this? Re the reaction of, I felt from some of the kids, uh -huh. uh, one in particular, who made it very clear what 
you know, what his family had taught him about Christianity. And I mentioned Buddhism, which I'm not going to do anymore, but... Smart! <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but, yeah, cool. just... Okay, okay. well, we're going to have a, a lot of talk about that. <laughs> Um, that's that'll be. Yes, sir. Just introductions. Why are you here? What are you hoping to hear? Uh, well, I'm here because my presenter didn't show, so I just kind of just stumbled in. Sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I'm Zach. I'm from Cleveland. Uh, and I'm very excited to be here. Is there a chair open? No. We got a few up front, Zach. Okay. Help us out. Thank you. that were raised and also I think the, the course of the workshop is going to address some stuff as well. So, Black Church 101. I love the Black Church. I love it. I love it. It's beautiful. I'm, I'm a third generation Baptist preacher. My family is full. Aunts, uncles, cousins, uh, of preachers, preachers and educators. That's my family. And uh, so from my earliest memories um, have something to do with church and probably running around church or hiding under the pews of a church. And so very much so the church is a part of uh, my story. And um, as much as I love the church, true love also means that I have critiques of the church. And so uh, I'm trying to share a little bit of my biases. Yes, I have a very optimistic, positive view of the church. That does not mean I don't have critiques of the church as well, black church or otherwise. And I hope to uh, touch on both what I feel to be very positive and very progressive and radicalized characteristics of the black church in particular. And also, I may touch on those things that I have a strong critique about in terms of the church as well. Throughout, the com throughout this uh, presentation, let it be a conversation, okay? And so, yes, sure, I got slides, but the presentation we will create together. And so, please feel free to pop up a question or perspective. How many of you have ever attended, just attended a black church before? Attended. How many of you have ever joined, become a member, a part of the community in a black church before? Cool, cool, cool. Okay, beautiful. Okay, so good, pretty good mix. And so, forgive me if I'm going to err more on, like, I know nothing at all about black church. I'll do a little bit of that in the beginning, and then we'll speed up and do some um, dropping on the different views and perspectives and different chapters of the black church. Uh, let me tell you real quick why I had to do this. I'm so excited about the presentation, and I wanted to, and I've been wanting to go around and do this presentation because um, of the general ignorance about the black church in mass media in particular. In fact, there were a lot of people, including myself, who were like a little perturbed, a little uh, irritated, uh, when then Senator Barack Obama was running for president, and y'all, the Jeremiah Wright piece, y'all you know, saw that, uh, Good Morning America, they show whatever it was, and uh, all of a sudden, all these questions were on the nightly news and, and on uh, daily talk shows about the black church. What is it? Why is there a need for a black church? And you know, uh, if you're going to be an organized, so so put that, put your personal stuff. I'm not saying throw it away, but just put it to the side for a moment. And if we're organizers, 
and in the black community, the black church is a hub, and that's what I'm going to be talking about, is a hub, one of the main hubs of organizing the black community. We've got to find some kind of way as organizers, as activists, as revolutionaries to at least put, either put our personal experience on the side if it needs to be put there, or to contextualize it with um, a fuller understanding of this, this, this organizing institution. Because whether people like it or not, the black church is an organizing institution. And so it does behoove us, as I think Jill, right? It does behoove us to, um, to understand it more, to draw closer, to try to learn how to engage. Yeah, I'm a mover too, man, so yeah, that thing. So hi, yeah, we'll just move around, just stay up. Um, it's, it, it behooves us to draw closer and to understand a little bit more. So what is the black church? This is from the Black Church in, America, in the African American Experience by Lincoln and Mamiya. This is one of the classic seminal works that if you're going to do some studying on the black church, you really want to go deep, this is a book you want to pick up. Uh, published in, I think, 90, yeah, 1990, and it kind of lays out the different uh, definitions, uh, characteristics, uh, the different streams within the black church. This is a book you want to get. I don't have it. I have some other books here I'll talk about a little bit later, but this is definitely one of the ones high on my list. Uh, the black church, those independent, historic, and totally controlled black controlled denominations which were founded after the Free African Society of 1787 and which constituted the core of black Christians. Independent. What is the black church? It's independent. Independent of what? White churches. <laughs> independent. The black church was born out of an anti-racism culture. Black people were going to, for example, United Methodist, or not United Methodist, uh, Christian Methodist Episcopal churches, for example, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, but black people were made to sit in balconies. Black people had to wait before taking communion. Uh, black people, if you were praying, official church, white church officials would come and pull black folk off their knees and you know, kick them out of the building. So the first Occupy movement, or at least one of the first Occupy movements, at least in the black tradition in America, was black folk occupying white churches saying, you're not going to kick us out. We're going to be here. Right. Even if you send us to the balcony, we're going to be here. Eventually, there was another stream as well that said, not only are we going to occupy our white churches, the another stream said, forget white churches. I was going to say something else, but I'm on live stream. <laughs> <laughs> forget white churches. We will create our own spiritual spaces to celebrate, organize, to, to come together, to uh, lift up one another, etc., etc. So these, there are multiple streams, and I hope through this presentation that Though I'm going to be using the term black church a lot, I hope during the presentation that I'll be faithful to showing some of the complexities of this dynamic institution. I don't want to oversimplify, I don't want to flatten it out. It's really a dynamic and there are multiple streams that are inside this dynamic, employed in this dynamic. Again, if you've got a question or comment or something, just jump off this conversation. Uh, so yeah, independent, historic, as I said earlier, yes, hundreds of years, uh, whether in the invisible institution, that was the name. Uh, that was um, uh, given when uh, enslaved Africans would go off into the brush by themselves, away from the plantation, and go and worship the invisible institution, invisible again to white power at the time, which frowned upon black people organizing. In fact, many of you know, y'all historians and organizers, you know that at one point it was illegal for black people to, to even gather without the presence of a white person. It was illegal. And so the invisible institution was black folks saying, we're going to slip off, off uh, by ourselves uh, into the forest, into the bush, wherever we need to go so that we might organize and worship the way we want. But yeah, great history there. And again, and I, I think I got a little excited with the controlled word. I typed it twice. But totally controlled by black people, black denominations. So that autonomy is super important, particularly when you understand in the context of this country, when black folks could not control even the basic, basic characteristics of life. Uh, uh, and uh, who to love, who can I marry, uh, who will I have children with, when all of those type of decisions are determined for you, right? When you can't even keep your children. If the white slave owner said your children are going to another state, they're going to another state. And you can die trying to keep them there, but you will die and children will move, unless there's some creative type of resistance in some other way. But very important that when you talk about the black church, you're talking about an autonomous institution where black people didn't have to check with white people before doing anything that black people wanted to do. So, very important characteristics as well. Um, 
What is the black church in structure and form? The black church has similarities with white churches? Of course. There's a pulpit. There's an altar. There's a preacher standing in the front. There's a choir. There's some music. I'm biased. Our music is better. There's a... Um, there's, I'm biased. I'm biased. But, but if you just walk in, very much so similarities to the structure and the form. But black Christians give different nuances uh, and different emphasis to theological views. Again, this is from the first book, the Lincoln and Mamiya, Mamiya book. But um, so in the black church tradition, God is uh, one of the anchor, um, the anchor profiles of God is, as, is of God as avenger. God as conqueror, God as liberator, right? And again, when we think about the context out of which the black church developed, it's understandable that if I'm being conquered, or if we are being conquered, if we are being oppressed, then it's, it's not a stretch if, to understand that black church has uh, viewed God as the great liberator. Especially when in Hebrew scriptures, you, and uh, you don't even have to go to church at all right, uh, to know about some of these more popularized uh, themes in the Bible. This, uh, uh, Hebrew slaves coming out of Egypt, Exodus, right? So all that kind of stuff resonated with people who were enslaved in this country. And so viewing God as liberator, as conqueror, as avenger, as the one who will make things right, and as the one who is directly involved in our story. So not this far off, far away. Uh, outer space, but a God who is here and now and involved in our struggle and in our story. James Cone came along in the 60s and he uh, wrote a book called uh, God of the Oppressed. Uh, Howard Thurman wrote a book called Jesus and the Disinherited. And both of these books and that, that genre of books were showing how black Christians and black spiritualists had viewed God as being actively involved in the here and the now. And you kind of see that stream. Well, any of us who uh, study African spirituality, that is one of those Africanisms that the Middle Passage and that, and that slavery and that Jim Crow could not rip away. God is active in my here and my now and all around, not just at that building down the street or what have you, right? Um, the, the theme of divine rescue is, is very popular in black church tradition. Um, and this, the, of course, the theme of freedom. God wants us to be free. Major thing. You can walk into most black churches in the country, and if you preach about God wanting us to be free, then you're going to get an amen. <laughs> you're going to get a whole bunch of amens. Free from what? Free from economic exploitation. Uh, free, of course, from slavery. Free, whatever, whatever the, uh, the oppressor or the, the oppressive instrument was, the, the uh, Belief and theme is God wants us to be free, and so whatever is not allowing us to be free is not of God. Um, black church was, I said this already, but black church was premised on the rock of anti-racial discrimination, that it was in the shadow of racism, uh, institutionalized racism, that the black church uh, got its, uh, its beginnings in response to that. And at the same time, and this is, it still shocks me that uh, sometimes I hear this, Somebody will ask, well, is the black church just for black people? No. By virtue of the beginnings of the black church, by virtue of black people being made to sit on balconies, being made to sit in the back of the church, being made to take communion after white people, the reflex and response to that racism was for black people to create a church where we're all God's children, right? And so that has great resonance in black. We're all God's children. And so it is not... If, if uh, you walk into a black church, white people, you will not kick them. Oh, no, kick them. Mm -mm, that skin is not right. Get them out of here. That's not going to work. No, because we remember. We remember what it was, uh, even ancestrally, uh, the stories and memories or whatever, uh, of being made to be second uh, balcony parishioners or whatever. And so it's a, very, it's a safe space and place for all of God's children. Um, I want to say a little, another quick word about freedom. Yes, it's a big thing, but not freedom in the kind of the Americanist idea of freedom, like a, this individualistic, I want to pursue my own destiny and chart my own course and pull my own self, myself up on my own bootstraps. Not that type of individualistic private freedom, more so a communal freedom. We will be free. That's why those songs that we sing when we're marching and rallying around Baltimore, wherever you're from, you often hear, we shall overcome. Be very clear. It's not, I shall overcome. 
It's we shall overcome. Very intentional, communal nature of the black church and of the black community that our identity is tied inextricably with the communal identity. So the Ubuntu theology of Africa will say, I am because we are, and we are because I am. And so there's not a, 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 this rigid individualism. No, I am who I am because of the community, and the community is who the community is because of me, that interrelated nature. Yeah, I see his not. That resonates. Y'all heard that. Y'all know that. Um, these are historic black denominations uh, in the United States. Uh, African Methodist Episcopal is one of the largest. Uh, AME Church, what they, get, what they call it, AME Zion Church, Christian Methodist. You can read them, National Baptist. Uh, these are, in Kojic, Church of God in Christ, these are the largest historic black denominations, Christian denominations in the country. And I can, this, this is Google, so I can, I'll just send it to people, it might want this information for further research or what have you. Don't feel like you got to break the neck right and everything. So the black church as hub of communal life. It has no challenger as the cultural womb of the black community. Uh, no challenger. The black church is, uh, as E. Frank Frazier says, a nation within a nation. That the black church has given birth to, matter of fact, I think it's the next time, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, the black church has no challenge in the culture of the black community. The black church, uh, one of the different uh, founding pillars of the black church, personal development, political activism, and the progenitor of new black institutions. Personal development. You walk into a black church, you will hear, you need to stop all that drinking. You will hear, uh, don't beat your wife. You will hear, um, you know, I, and I'm saying this because it trips me out when, uh, you know, mainstream press might start talking about black church. What black people need to do is start telling their children this, that, and the other. And I'm like, have you ever attended a black church before? Because every week there are messages, whether from the pulpit or whether from people who are giving announcements about different things that will help strengthen the fabric of community. And so there are constant um, opportunities, there's constant ways that in the life of the ethos of the black church, uh, uh, black life is affirmed. There's space for black children to stand and, and sing a song. And like I did when I was doing my Easter play, I was six years old, and I had a little poem. Some of y'all had to sing. You had to stand up from the church and say a poem, right? And I mess up, and I forgot it. And uh, I'm like six, so I start crying. And in, in the black church tradition, Black mothers, mothers of the church is almost like an official type. The mothers, if you go, who are the mothers of this church? Let's walk into church. Who are the mothers, right? Who are the elders? Who are the ones who help to hold this, uh, this community together? And I start crying, and the mothers say, take your time, baby. Take your time. Because this was a safe place for me to mess up, get encouragement, and get it right, and have people love me to a rightness. Did you, have, you, have you met some mothers of the church, too? Yeah. Or some of the elders of yeah. up alone? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I, yeah. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> and so, yeah, so that personal development, ways that we help in the personal uh, uh, development of, of individuals also there, but political activism is also there, and uh, we're going to go more into this in a little bit. And then finally, new black institutions. So many black institutions got their start or were organized in a black church. For those of us in Baltimore, Morgan State University, uh, we got its start. It was a um, uh, school to train Methodist ministers, but it was the black church to help to bring that about. Uh, think about your favorite rapper, your favorite rapper, even if that rapper raps about killing and shooting grandmothers and, and selling dope. When they get the award, they say, first, I want to thank God. <laughs> because most times that rapper or that artist, from Beyonce to whoever, Usher, name them, got their start in a church. It was a church that created the stage. Where else, if black people didn't control other spaces and community, where else could black people go to, let me share my gift. I want to shine. I want to radiate my uniqueness in some way. And the black church will create that. And so from poets to artists to speakers, et cetera, the black church, black church was a stage for uh, the sharing of those gifts. And these institutions, from schools to banks uh, to you name it, hospitals, you name it, the black church helped to give it its start. Uh, here in Baltimore, we have groups like the Associated Black Charities. We have groups like the Inter Interdenominational Ministerial Alliance. We have groups like BUILD, uh, uh, Baltimore, uh, uh, 
let me say, Baltimore, y'all know Bill, and I forgot the acronym now, but Bill is, comes out of the Saul Alinsky organizing all those groups all over the country anyway, and so, but the black church helps help to give those groups uh, its start. I do want to raise up some dynamics, and sorry, this one's down here as well, but some dynamics uh, in the black church. Gabriel Wilmore says the black churches have been the most conservative and the most radical institutions at the very same time. And this is an important slide because you might wonder if you walk into one black church and you hear a particular message and then you walk into a different black church and you hear a different message and you might say, whoa, wait a minute. Looks the same, sounds the same, feels the same, but this message, this is something different. Uh, Mumia and Lincoln helped to um, show some of the polarities that are present in the black church, and I would say church in general uh, anyway, but the black church in particular, some of the polarities. And so black churches are more or less all of these different dynamics, more or less, depending on what congregation you're in, the story, they're a little bit leaning this way or that way, Jim. Could you describe the first one a little? I'm not sure what you mean there. Right, and so um, priestly versus prophetic. So you'll find the black church somewhere on the spectrum between priestly and prophetic. Priestly is marrying people, burying people, serving communion, uh, a, a priest, a official role, performing the rights of a, a religious organization. The prophetic is more of challenging social injustice involved in communal affairs, the center of public life, challenging uh, unjust laws, etc. And so on the spectrum, you'll find a black church either leaning more toward a priestly role, we're here just to marry you, bury you, kiss your baby, serve you communion, you know, preach good sermons, pray and go home. Or you'll find churches more on the prophetic role, fight the power, we gotta fight the power that be, you know. Somewhere in between there and Sometimes the church will move, depending on you know, what the day is or what the issue is. The church might move one way or the other. Otherworldly versus this world is pretty self-explanatory. Some black churches are just so concerned about getting to heaven. I just got to get to heaven. You know, if we just get to heaven, everything will be all right. And the other churches are more this worldly. What's going on here and now and, and, and what's happening in our community? How can we get involved? Universalism versus particularism. Universe, the universal message of Christianity, God loves us all, right? And so a church might lean more to that, or a church might lean more to particularism. That what does God have to say to black people? What does God have to say to us? Not, not uh, discarding the universal message of God's love, but in this community, what does God's love mean for us in our times, in our setting and context? Communal versus privatist, uh, privatistic. Uh, spoken that just a little bit already, but churches that are, are and, and in most of my experiences, black church has been a communal experience. That very relational, I'm going to talk more about that a little bit later, but very relational. Uh, that we know that's your grandmother, that's your grandson, that's your, and there's a communal identity. Uh, a sharing of life, to, a communal sharing of life, right? Or the more privatistic, I'm coming to get a spiritual service, and once the spiritual service is completed, once, you know, whatever, I'm gone without that real communal cohesion. Charismatic versus bureaucratic, charismatic. And so a lot of black churches, uh, there's a lot of attention and focus on the preacher, the black pastor, organizers. For churches that are on this end of the polarity, you've got to know the pastor. The pastor serves in many ways as gatekeeper to the community. That's why politicians knock down the black church door during election time to get with the pastor. Can I say a word, pastor? And the pastor, as gatekeeper says, yes, you can say a word. And if the pastor allows the person to say a word, it's almost like a blessing that the pastor gives to that politician. And the congregation gets the message. If pastor allows him in here, there's something that must be good about this guy or this woman. She might, she might be all right. The pastor let in. Charismatic, church that have been more here. Or bureaucratic, uh, more focused on structures, you'll find a lot of uh, bureaucratic character in like the AME churches, the AME Zion Church. Of course, as a Methodist church, the focus is on the methods and the rules and the policy, et cetera. And finally, resistance versus accommodation. So the black church as an agent to help people to uh, assimilate into American life and culture, or the black church as an, organ as an organization that helps people resist, organize resistance against uh, things that are deemed to be harmful, hurtful, or unjust toward black people. And so, again, along that spectrum, you'll find different churches. And so, 
It won't be a surprise if you walk into one church and hear a certain message and walk into a different one and hear a different message. You just have to find out, okay, where is this church in the polarity? Where is this church on the spectrum of these? And there are many others that you can add, but this is helps, helps us. And it's not static. I'm, you know, We can be priestly one day, prophetic another if something comes up. And so there's movement. It's a dynamic organization. That was heavy, y'all, so thank y'all for enduring that. <laughs> All right. Black church is a big deal. You said it in your comments. I agree. I amen what you said <laughs> when you said this. It's a big deal, and it frustrates me when activists, organizers come uh, into the black community or go into black space and try to ignore the black church. It's a big deal. Uh, the role of black church is organizing space and seedbed for social change, reform, and revolution has been grossly minimized and or ignored, often to the peril of the organizer. You leave frustrated, like, I, the plan was perfect, I had it all together, I was going to do this, that, and the other, this is going to get us all free. <laughs> but I didn't go to the church. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't think about the church as organizing space, right? And so, often minimized, totally ignored. In true American fashion, those who have been nurtured in the bosom of black church have been decontextualized and grossly individualized. And I raise that because I think about uh, like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., right? And so we love talking about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., right? He is like, you know, and, and it's not taking, I'm not taking nothing from Dr. King, all right? Dr. King is cool. My beef is this, Dr. King has been made into a caricature. He's, he's like your favorite cartoon character, like Captain Planet or something. He's, he's, he's like totally separated from the context that created them. And my point is that in the American individualizing nature, we want to lift up King while ignoring the context and the community that created King. So when King, so King is a second generation Baptist preacher. King was groomed and molded in a black church. And though we celebrate King as rightly we should, we also have to be sensitive and respectful and revere the community that created a king. And there are many other kings that the black church has created. I'm talking about a few of them as well. And so I wanted to just get that, that to, to truly and fully honor Dr. King is to also be sensitive to the community that helped mold him. And so, and, and his activities. It's, you would almost in some, in some in a, thank y'all for letting me vent a little bit. This is really healthy for me. <laughs> but in, in, in some of the uh, presentations and portrayals every year during Black History Month, um, you, would, you could almost get a, a picture of King as somebody who was not a preacher at all. He was a Baptist preacher. He raised scripture. He spoke the language of black church and black people would get behind him at least uh, to a great degree, at least uh, he's talking about Vietnam and things got a little shaky. But up to that point, it was the black church that was saying, go ahead King. Stand up, you got it, we're with you. You know, So, very important to keep that in mind. Um, and I'm gonna talk about some ways, along with this, this first point, I'm gonna talk about some ways very quickly near the end that if you're organizing in a black community, in a black city, some things that will help if you're really trying to uh, create that mesh and do some work together in solidarity. Really quick history lesson. <clears throat> this is Richard Allen. Richard Allen's one of those guys who said, forget y'all white church, we're gonna start our own thing. He went to start, along with Absalom Jones, they went to start the African Methodist Episcopal Church in 1787 uh, because the Methodist Episcopal Church discriminated against black members. In 1807 and 1815, uh, Richard Allen and Absalom Jones and the rest of the church, they successfully sued for the right of the congregation to exist as an independent institution. They sued the Christian, uh, the uh, Methodist Episcopal Church. The Methodist Episcopal Church, of course, wanted to stay in control of this, this group. It was so important that they be independent, they took them to court and sued them and won. We, don't, we want autonomy. We want the right of self-determination. Here's another a person that is made into a, a, a caricature. Harriet Tubman, right? She was a member of the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. In fact, she was uh, the African Methodist, Methodist Episcopal Zion Church was known as the Freedom Church in its day day because of its insistence on emancipation from spiritual, economic, and social change. Chains. And so um, salvation, you've heard 
preachers preach about we want to be saved. You got to be saved. But in the black church tradition, in large measure, salvation does not mean where I go, does not just mean where I go when I die. Salvation has to mean what's going on in here and now. From its early beginnings, the AME Zion Church has been known for its spirit of reform and activism. And I raised Harriet Tubman's picture next to this because, as I said, she was a member of the AME Zion Church denomination uh, and also the Mother Zion Church in Harlem. Uh, Sojourner Truth was a member, Frederick Douglass was a member. Frederick Douglass, another one that we lift up without really contextualizing, he was an ordained minister in the AME Zion Church. Harriet Tubman, and I have a picture of this next, uh, she ran the Underground Railroad. This is Mother Zion AME Church in Harlem today. Harriet Tubman ran the Underground Railroad through this church. Very important, the church of Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, and Frederick Douglass, this was a stop on the Underground Railroad. The church was directly involved in subversive activity and direct resistance. Right, and so very important to, to understand black church in that context. This is not just coming, singing, praying, and going home. The church was involved on the Underground Railroad and other direct resistance actions. So John of Truth preached in this church, preached uh, women's rights, preached about uh, 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 discrimination, et cetera, et cetera. And so, Understanding them in light of their religious tradition and context and community is very, so, very much so important. And I'm going fast, y'all, because I feel like it's time to move. It is. Lord, mercy. Okay, let's move. All right, these people, you never, you know, maybe didn't hear about them in school. We weren't taught. Reverend Earl Little and Louise Little, parents of Malcolm X. Go ahead. Malcolm X, I was about to say that. You got it, man. You should be doing up here doing a presentation. Uh, but yeah, Bert, and I'm glad you know that because many people do not raise that that Reverend Earl Little, Baptist preacher, father of Malcolm X. Malcolm X was a preacher's kid. He grew up in a preacher's home. His dad, Reverend Little, was a member of the United Negro Improvement Association. That's Marcus Garvey's Back to Africa, Do For Yourself, Black People Get Organized movement that Malcolm X's dad was a part of. And so you see the influence of dad on Malcolm X coming up and seeing his father in that very strong black self-determination uh, tradition. Reverend Albert Cleve uh, was the founder of the Shrine of the Black Madonna. They got churches now in Detroit, Houston. They are in Atlanta. Um, and they are in uh, South Carolina, I believe, as well. He's the author of The Black Messiah and Black Christian Nationalism. Uh, he follows in the tradition, of course, of Marcus Garvey and Malcolm X. In fact, he was a contemporary of Malcolm X. They stood together in panels and uh, uh, activism and the like. But he's a very important person to know. I'm speaking Father Earl Neal. He was the rector at St. Augustine's Episcopal Church. And though not a black denomination, this black preacher very much so identified with the Black Panther Party. He was a spiritual advisor to BPP in Oakland and the host of the BPP Free Breakfast Program. And so when you think about the Black Panther Party, you celebrate them, you talk about all the great things they're doing, great, understand there was a church that opened its doors to that Black Panther Party, and the free breakfast program happened in that church. A word to white radicals, real quick. You're trying to get in with a black church, you're trying to move, trying to do some things together, relational organizing before issue-based organizing. Don't lead with your issue. Establish relationships. Because that's the ethos in which the black church is, is, is tied together in relationship. So your issue may be a great issue, but if you lead with it without relationship, people will say, okay, yeah, I'll get back to you, and you'll never get a call back because we don't know who you are. Who are you? How are we connected? Spend time uh, in, in establishing, and this is also like basic organizing stuff too, so it's not Jermaine just a black church. Relational organizing. Sit and learn before you stand and speak. Sit and learn. Even the stuff that, that you might have learned and heard for the first time today, there's so much more. You can't cram hundreds of history of black church into this time. But go and do that study and, and really dig deep. And if you go, if there's a black church in your community or nearby you're trying to connect with, go in as a student. Hey, listen, I'm trying to learn more about the history of this church, the community, and I'd love to sit with somebody. Who's the best person I could talk to here about that? Great. Start there. Sit. We want to really learn more about each in, in uh, the black church as a whole and also individual churches, their history. Find out what that church is already involved in instead of bringing an agenda with you. You may find out that that church is already active. Matter of fact, you will. The black church is already active and has been active. Remember what I said at the top? We don't get commercials on MSNBC about the things we do in the community for most of the churches. Now, some of them got the money, they got TV, evangelism, some of that kind of good stuff. Not those. The vast majority of black churches and churches in general 
uh, 200, 254, and doing some great work in the community. Find out what they're doing. Plug into what they're doing. Offer the support before you ask what you can do for me. Offer, this is what I can offer to what you're already doing, whether it's a charity or a justice initiative. And if you're more of a justice person and they're doing charity, do charity for a little while. <laughs> you got to earn, earn the right to speak up about something else. And you earn that by paying dues and being supportive of what the church is already kind of active in. Respect black autonomy and self-determination. Remember that in, in space in this country, this is a very cherished space where black people control, black people decide, and that's very important in the context when you go to work and you can't decide. When you, you know, go to school and you can't, even the curriculum that our children learn, that's a white European Western curriculum. Our children are not even allowed to learn about, and that's, I'm not talking about ancient history, I'm talking about even 2012. Our children are not even allowed to learn about uh, their unique story and their place in the world, right? And so just respecting the fact that when you come into a black church space, respecting the fact that this is a space where people have been uh, uh, molding and shaping and protecting and preserving for a very long time for our spiritual, for our emotional, for our psychological sanity to be able to say we don't control nothing out there, but at least in here we control something. It gives us a sense of dignity uh, in light of that. I'm going to have to shut down in here. Any, uh, oh, good. Good. Uh, any, uh, anything that came to mind? Any questions? Any issues? Any specific organizing you're trying to do? And, and uh, you want a, a, a perspective on what you're doing? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Um, what's, um, can you talk a little bit about the, the translation, about the King James Version that seems to be very... Oh, man, that's good, Zach. <laughs> yeah, KJ, yeah, KJV is very important. Um, you see some churches moving away from that. but. Uh, initially, as the black church was being organized, that was the version that was available. So many people learned to read okay. by way of the KJV. And so it has a very uh, pronounced place in uh, the black church, uh, even despite its many, many, many flaws. Do you think it's good that they're starting to get away? I think so. Yeah. I think so. There's jargon and words that's not even, we don't even use anymore. And there's racist perspective in the King James Version. Sure, that's that, why I thought it was just yeah, crazy. Thank you. Use, yeah. So what are they moving toward? Well, I don't know what they are. I am moving toward like um, uh, the NIV. I use most likely the NRSV, New Revised Standard Version. Um, and I try to share all the different translations to try to wiggle people away from just reading KJV. I'll just give them a whole bunch and make them see the differences. Yes? As far as like, what are some successful um, movements that, that you've been a part of that, are, that um, incorporate, you know, different black churches and other institutions, say, in Baltimore, and like, what were some things that make them successful? Hmm. Um, well, depending on how you define success, I would say. Or maybe that just came out of, either just came out of black churches in this area, or okay. were larger. Well, let me give a contemporary uh, piece on the um, Trayvon Martin. Uh, Hoodie Sunday almost became like a a real event in many black churches where black people wore hoods. And so that was something that on the informal networks and grapevine of black church life that went out. And we had hoodies on at Pleasant Hope. There were hoodies at Empowerment Temple all over the country. And so that's one. And again, I mean, that's just a moment. That's not like it's a movement, but that's a moment uh, in terms of uh, that type of collective organizing. The black church was very much so involved in challenging apartheid in South Africa. And so when the um, Legislative Black Caucus, uh, whatever they call it on the federal level, uh, was born and got its real push with the black church in uh, fighting with uh, apartheid in South Africa. I'm trying to personally work with churches now around, I heard somebody talk about BDS, and I'm personally working with churches now in that realm and challenging uh, the occupa occupation of Palestine. And uh, there are African heritage delegations that are now going to Israel, Palestine to occupy territories. And the number of pastors are beginning to merge and gel around that issue as well. But there's a whole range of, of, of different topics. Personally, um, uh, Katie is, I know, I got to go. I'm sorry, we have, I'm sorry, we started late, so we've been going a little bit longer, but we have to wrap. We got to wrap. Okay, so my information's up there. Let's continue the dialogue, even if you're from a different city. I know pastors in your city. I know churches there. And so if you're trying to organize, if, if you think I can be helpful, I'd love to assist. What's your name again? I'm so, oh, yeah, that's very important. <laughs> My name is Heber Brown. Heber Brown. I have cards here if you want to find me on Twitter, Facebook, or whatever. We keep the dialogue going. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.